welcome to another episode of the Best Police to Drive For podcast. I'm Mark Morell, and I do have a complete head, even though the blurring is chopping out bits of it, uh, and uh, we're going to have to fix that in post-production. But I am joined today by one of my favorite people to talk to, Emery Mills from FTC Transportation. How are you doing, Emery? I'm good, and thank you for having me. All right. Well, we've got lots of things to go through. Uh, I am always interested in talking to you about what's happening at FTC because you are a smaller fleet and there is always a perception that small fleets can't do as all the things that the big fleets can do and somehow they're at a disadvantage and you ruin that argument for people over and over again. Uh, so we're going to dig into a little bit of that and uh, talk about some of the things that you're doing uh, that get you uh, onto the best fleets top 20 year after year and now into the Hall of Fame for multiple years. So let's start sort of back at the beginning. How did you get involved with the best fleets program and what prompted you to uh, participate? Um, well, we had been longtime um, members with the TCA, the Truckload Carriers Association, and um, we started hearing about best fleets and some of the things that were going on there. And um, it was kind of a curiosity to start with. And as we kind of learned more, we were, you know, we kind of tried it out the first year just to see what would happen. It wasn't really thinking that we had any way to compete with some of the larger carriers. Um, we did never expect to make the list um, that first that first year. And um, we were shocked when we did. Um, and of course, super grateful. It's it's quite an honor. But, um, you know, just going through all of the questions, of course, you know, going through the interview, you guys have been so great in just answering our questions too to help us. But um, we just learned a lot. I think we learned a lot about ourselves. We were doing a lot of things already. And um, we just probably didn't even realize because we hadn't put pen to paper and made lists of everything that we were doing, but we learned really quickly what we were doing and things that we could improve, could improve on. And it's really been for us kind of a way to improve every year to make ourselves better, not just to get on the list or to win an award or anything like that. Um, at the end of the day, it is for our drivers. It is for our team here. Um and we love just getting information from other best fleets, learning what they're doing and taking some of that and applying it to what we do here. So interesting. Uh, you're a small fleet, as I said, you're 23, 25 drivers somewhere in that neighborhood. 25. So how many people do you even have in the office supporting this? <laughs> um, so in our office, we have six total office staff and we have two full time mechanics. So there's eight of us here at the terminal on any given day. And then, of course, drivers, as they come through, um, we may have one or two drivers, you know, here and there. We don't have drivers here every day um, because we do run all 48 states, lower states. So it, it's not like you've got a large team with people that could be spending a fair bit of time putting together this, uh, you know, answers to the questionnaire or, or prepping for the interview or any of that stuff. So I'm fascinated by how you even find time for it. Like, <laughs> And the first year you go through that questionnaire, it's not a fun experience. It's a, a lot of questions to answer. So how did you, like, how do you have time for that? Um, well, I mean, you make time, but, um, you know, it's, it's something that's not just done within a week or two. It's something that we're taking notes on throughout the year. So, and, and I will say our president, Greg, he has been very proactive about um, reminding me, Hey, you should include this with best fleets or, Hey, I, he goes through all of the detail at the end of the year when you publish your books and we look at our comparison to other companies and we go, oh, well, we were doing that. Why didn't we talk about that? And so he actually goes through and highlights and marks up the book. And um, so that I remember to include things that maybe we didn't include or that we forgot to mention. But just throughout the year, we are, um, if we change a, a process, if we add something, if we add a piece of technology or we tweak something, um, I'm kind of just making notes throughout the year. I literally send myself an email. I have a best fleets file folder on my Outlook and it just sits there until the end of the year. And then I'm pulling all of that data out. And then of course I send out a email to everybody and just say, Hey, working on this, do you have any additional information to add? And I get a flood of information from everybody um, just to make sure that we've included everything and covered everything. So interesting. That's a, a great example of something that isn't really that difficult to do if you think about doing it. And 
it, it makes perfect sense. Uh, so rather than waiting until September when you get nominated or like November when you have the interview booked and scrambling to get it all done and then being intimidated by this massive questionnaire, even people that have been in it before, there's a lot of things to go through and update and starting the process then. If you just keep notes, so you sort of keep like the questionnaire or last year's notes mm -hmm. available and then just kind of update it and then uh, put bits on top of it throughout the year. And then when you get to the evaluation period in the fall, it's not really that much. It's more just transferring it from one place to another. Absolutely. And and honestly, the tool, you know, the first year is a very daunting year. I would tell anybody that's doing it for the first time, do schedule more time than what you think it's going to take, because it's going to take that and, and then some. But, uh, you know, you guys have a great tool on there where we can view last year's answer and I can copy it, you know, you know, put it in there. And then we're just making edits to it. Essentially, we're taking things away or we're adding things to it. And so we're making edits. Um, which has really streamlined the process throughout the year. It, it still takes quite a while. It's still a very lengthy process, um, but it really kind of reminds us of things throughout the year too. As we go through the questions, we're like, oh, you know, because we don't have everything in our notes. There's things that we forget. We don't take notes every single day, um, but we may see a question and go, oh, we are doing that. Or, oh, you know, it reminded us of some other things. So um, it, it's been just a really good process for us. It's kind of a kind of an audit process, if you will, for our, um, not just recruiting practices, but our retention practices for our drivers. Um, and we consider it a major recruiting tool when we can put that best fleets to drive for logo on our equipment, on our emails, um, on our website. We consider that, I mean, that, that's built in advertising for us. And so that recruiting portion, you know, we you were talking about the time that we spend on it, but we spend a lot of time recruiting drivers. And that's just part of it. It kind of goes into our recruiting function. So um, it's a great recruiting tool for us. We get a lot of drivers that contact us because they heard about us through Best Fleets. Well, that's interesting. Kind of looking at it as an audit process that doesn't happen once a year, but is kind of ongoing throughout the year. That's Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so do you have something that you do kind of after the announcements are made and at this time of the year when you've got your reports and your re your results book and all of that stuff? Do you do anything with that, all of that? Um, well, we're, um, you know, because we're a small office, you know, we all wear multiple hats. So like at this time of year, we're gearing up for insurance renewals. Um, so kind of everything that we do plays off of everything else. So whether it's that we've won an award or that we've had no DOT recordable accidents or, you know, it all plays into each other. So um, it's kind of just this revolving, the the file that I use for best fleets, I use for multiple other things. I use that when I'm working on insurance renewals. We use that when we're working on advertising. So, you know, it, it's kind of a throughout the year, we're using all of that information just in a lot of different ways for a lot of different things. So um, participation in different things that we do, but, you know, working with our driver committee, working with our safety committee meetings, we're, we're just using that data constantly and we're pulling from that. So if we have a safety meeting and we have a driver that has recommended something or in our Facebook group, um, somebody has put information out there. That's just information that we're building off of. So it may be a, a tool that we can use, a technology tip, um, some new technology that's coming out. It's just like I said, it, it's all kind of integrated and it plays off of each other throughout the year. Interesting. Yeah, that's a really nice approach to it. A really good way to sort of think about how to make these things part of the our organizational DNA rather than a task that you complete once a year that ends up being a headache. Like I see a lot of people that, oh, they're stressing about their audit and they kind of start from a, a blank page when they're trying to get ready for their audit. And then they finish that and it's done. And then they go on and they start doing some driver appreciation week thing. And that's totally separate and on its own. And then they finish that and they start doing the best fleet stuff. And it's totally separate and on its own. Anytime you have those things in silos like that, you end up behind the eight ball because you're starting from scratch every time rather than building on the things that all fit together, which you've found a way to kind of magnify your uh, your abilities and kind of like a force multiplier because you've got a small team. But by putting it all together and working on it constantly through the year, you end up being ready for all of these things whenever they come up. So well, it doesn't really matter. 
I think it's a benefit too. I know we we talk about, you know, that we can't keep up with the large carriers in a lot of ways. We, you know, we don't have a staff. I don't have a recruiting team that works under me or, you know, safety supervisors that work under me. I mean, we all cover, you know, I, I manage, for instance, our website as well as, you know, some of my safety duties. And, you know, it, it's all, we all kind of work on those things, like I said, throughout the year, but the benefit of us probably being smaller um, one of the bigger benefits is, is that we're all touching all of those things throughout the year. So insurance renewals, everybody's touching that. I'm asking questions of our dispatchers. I'm asking questions and, and the same with our best fleet survey. And like I said, it is just so, you know, one feeds off of the other. If you treat them all like individual things, you are just doubling your work and tripling your work. I mean, we can, mm -hmm. we can use all of those to just better each element. So Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. And one of the things that you have done really well is finding ways to get everybody involved. And so you talked about you know drivers in your Facebook groups and some of the other different programs that you have. And that's always one of the things that stands out for me is, is how well you're able to collaborate with people uh, to figure out some of the things that you should be doing and, and where the best practices are for your specific group. Let's talk a little bit about how you do that on the uh, the equipment side, because that's something where I, every couple of years you put something new in your trucks or you're doing something different. And it always surprises me. And, and it always comes from um, feedback from the drivers. I remember you had a fitness thing inside your, your trucks that you're putting in for uh, a little while. Now you've got some extra steps that you've added in for safety. So can you talk a little bit about your process for, you know, how you get that feedback and some of these things that you've added and, and you know, why the drivers were after them? Um, so again, we're, we're working off driver feedback is, is a main input. So even if we've found out about something, um, you know, I give a lot of credit to our president, Greg, he reads a lot and he stays on top of the news and, and all the different things that are changing, whether it's a regulation or a new technology or a new anything. Um, he he's always reading and feeding us that information, but he's also, you know, we'll quickly go out and see a driver and say, hey, what do you think about this? You know, we're not waiting for a safety meeting to talk about it or a driver committee meeting. Um, you know, he immediately wants that driver feedback. OK, we read about this. What do you think about this? But throughout the day. Um, on any given week or day, um, drivers are sending us information too. They're seeing links, they're seeing questions, they're hearing things out on the CB radio. Um, and so they're they're feeding that information to us too, um, whether it's through a text message and a link that they're sending to us, or it's, um, like I said, on our Facebook groups, um, that's become very popular and a, a great place for them to share information. Um, but they're feeding that information to us just as quickly or sometimes more quickly than we can feed it out to them to ask them questions. Um, sometimes it's not doable and, and we will tell them that, you know, sometimes it's not a good fit for us or something that we have to look out down the road. Obviously, we have a very tight budget that we work within um, and some constraints there. But um, if it's something that we can do, if it's something that we can research and make happen, we want to do that. If they think that it's something that would make their job easier, make life easier on the road, um, make them more efficient, whatever that is, make them safer, we want to do that. So, Well, you kind of gloss over a couple of things that I want to um, reiterate there because they're critical elements of that that sort of feedback for the drivers when they give these suggestions about you're giving them uh, feedback about whether or not it's feasible, why it is or isn't feasible, if you can do it now, if you can look at it for later, or if it's not something that you can consider at all. And a big part of success in any of these programs we've found is people just um, having that kind of circle of communication. So it will be the driver makes a suggestion and the company never acknowledges it, never does anything with it. Well, eventually drivers just stop making suggestions. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, driver makes a suggestion, the company talks about it as a group, talks about it in an open forum, explains what they're going to do as a result, maybe implement some of these things. That keeps that flow of ideas coming through. And it also refines the kind of things that come in. Once drivers understand, okay, this is not going to be feasible because of this and this and this, well, the next time they have an idea, they're going to be thinking about that as well, and they will be more specific in the things that they're suggesting. So over time, you get a refined set of ideas from them that are better 
uh, going to fit your uh, business model because the drivers understand the constraints. They understand the requirements. And the fact that you keep that circle going, you talked about Greg going out and talking to drivers and the Facebook groups. So even though you're not seeing drivers on a regular basis, you're still finding ways to keep that communication going enough that they feel that they're being heard and they're continuing to contribute to it. So I think those are all critical elements that people sometimes gloss over. You know, it's not just about getting feedback. It's about how you incorporate that feedback into your next steps. Well, and, and let's be honest, let's, um, you know, the drivers are the vital element there. They know what's going to work for them and what's not going to work. I sit behind a computer. Um, you know, yes, I'm out on the yard some or out in the shop some, but the majority of my day and week is behind a computer. I haven't driven a truck. Um, some of our staff members have driven a truck at one time or another, but they're not driving currently. So they're not facing the same obstacles that our drivers are facing currently. So not to say that their experiences are relevant, but we want real-time information from our drivers and they're able to give us that. And so it, it's vital that we're listening to them and letting them know that they're being heard. And one of the things that we've seen too is when we have a um, somebody send in a link with some information, it could be something as simple as, you know, there's going to be this interstate closure. Did you know about this? I just saw this. We'll send out a message through our um, messaging system in the trucks. We'll send that message out to the drivers and we make sure to give them credit. You know, hey, thanks, Fred, for letting us know about this today. Or thanks to Robert for letting us know about this today. And by doing that, not only do they feel appreciated for sharing the information, but it kind of encourages other people to share information too. Like, oh, well, you know, I, I want to share something. I want to tell them this, you know, and it lets them know that we're not just taking this information from emails or magazines, that we're listening to them. And so it kind of helps to increase that flow of information when we're doing that. Because I've noticed, especially on a day that I send out one of those messages and thank a specific driver for the information, I get about four or five more pieces of information that afternoon from different drivers <laughs> because it's fresh on their mind. Like, oh, well, since she's, you know, listening and she's sharing information, I want to share this, this and this. So um, it, it kind of opens that door so that they they realize that we really are listening um, you know, with only six of us in the office, sometimes we don't always grab the phone the second that it rings, mm -hmm. or we don't respond to an email in the first five or 10 minutes it was sent. Um, so it lets them know that we are listening. We may be delayed sometimes, but we are listening and we are taking that into account. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, uh, that really kind of underscores the sort of value of the communication and the benefit of doing it the way you're doing it. You mentioned earlier about some things that you know larger fleets are doing that you may be not able to do or this kind of sense smaller fleets uh, struggle sometimes with things that larger fleets can handle. But there are a variety of places where you are still doing things that beat the larger fleets and are way more elaborate than what they're doing. Uh, so I want to talk about a couple of those and just go through them. Um, one thing that we see is a obviously a huge issue in large segments of the country is parking for drivers. And a lot of the larger companies are able to do things to alleviate that issue uh, for their drivers. And the smaller fleets say, well, we're only a small company, so we can't do anything. But as is often the case, you've gone and dealt with that issue uh, on your own as well, or figured out some answers to make life better for drivers. So can you talk a little bit about how you handle those parking issues and what you do for your drivers to kind of minimize the hassles for them? Um, well, unfortunately, we can't take it away entirely. Um, they they still have problems in certain areas. Um, dispatch does, you know, they're very cognizant of that there are areas that are hard if the driver is not picking up or delivering until late and getting to a truck stop until later in the evening, they're not going to be able to park. They're not going to be able to find a space. So they try to work those schedules as best they can. Sometimes our hands are tied, but they do try to work those schedules. The other thing is, is there's a lot of places that drivers could get parking, but they have to pay for parking. And a driver should never have to pay for parking. Um, I mean, I understand the need on the other side for that to happen, but the driver themselves, especially as a company driver, shouldn't have to pay to park least safe for the night and get the rest that they need. So if they have to pay for parking, that's an automatic reimbursement for us. And um, we're going to reimburse them on their check, or if they need to get an EFS check, a cash advance ahead of time, we're going to make that happen for them as well. That's available to them. Um, but we never want them to be out of pocket for having to park and find a safe place to rest. Um, you know, 
because we're the core carrier for Feed the Children, they do have warehouses throughout the U.S. Um, obviously, if we're in one of those areas, they can park there. Um, but there's not a warehouse in every city or every state. So, um, you know, we try to work with our customers, dispatch will work with our customers to see if the drivers can stay there. If they do have to leave, if we do have to use personal conveyance to get to a safe place to park for the night, our drivers can do that. And like I said, we will pay for parking wherever they can find a park. So, and our dispatch will help to help them find a location if they can't find one. So your challenges in that area, not only are, are the same challenges that other fleets have, but that's compounded by the fact that a lot of your business is taking disaster relief supplies into different areas. So that must make it even more difficult. You're going into a, a flood zone or hurricane uh, ravaged area, tornado uh, area. Like, How do you handle that? How do you make sure that people are getting in and out okay and having the rest spaces that they need? Um, a lot of it is coordinated. Of course, Feed the Children has a big part of that, but it's coordinated through the local officials that are there, whether it's law enforcement or, um, you know, whatever emergency management teams are on the ground. Um, you know, we want our drivers to, before they go in, if there's time, we want them to stop ahead of time, especially if it's a flood zone or something. We don't drive in floodwaters, um, but they're going to stop at the nearest location they can get. They're going to take their breaks there. They're going to get rest. But we always make sure to, we want our drivers to make sure that they are stocked up in the truck. And this is just a good safety habit regardless, to make sure that they have food and water in the truck at all times, to make sure that they have warm clothes, blankets, you know, warm boots, um, gloves, things that they may need if the truck were to break down. They need those just the same as if they're going into a disaster relief area. Um, we're fortunate in the fact that a lot of times when we go into disaster relief areas, because the community in need, they're, um, whether it's a local church or a community effort, a lot of times they're there. They're, they will provide meals sometimes for our drivers while they're there um, or you know, make sure that they have water or whatever it may be. Um, but it's it's really coordinating with whoever's on the ground with the local emergency management when we go in because we don't we are never going to send our trucks and our drivers into some place that's not safe. So, like I said, we're never going to send them in the midst of a storm. We have to wait till the storm passes. We have to wait till floodwaters recede. We can't drive into the middle of the disaster when the disaster is occurring. But we do want to be there just as quickly afterwards as possible. OK, interesting. Um, do you find that the nature of your business attracts a different type of candidate? Uh, you know, you're not just a regular trucking company. You're kind of one part regular trucking company and one part sort of mission for the betterment of society. Do you find that attracts a different type of candidate? Um, typically, I would say yes. Um, you know, we have a few drivers that believe us to just be like every other trucking company um, until they come to work here. Um, and so they learn really quickly that we're a lot different from most trucking companies. Um, we still do the same freight and customer loads that most trucking companies do. But with this Feed the Children element, they're our main customer, if you will. They are who we are here to serve. So they take priority over everything. Um, if we have to um, you know, cancel a load to go do a disaster relief or hunger relief, that's what we're going to do. Um, and our customers, our other customers and brokers, they're aware of that. They know the nature of our business. They work with it. And our drivers get to know that very quickly. Um, but I will say it does attract um, a, a great quality of, of drivers um, because they they come to us and they say, well, I don't want to just drive a truck for somebody anymore. I want to do some good. And so they feel like they're doing some good and touching communities in need. And so I do think that it, it brings in somebody that's not just out there looking for just the paycheck. You know, they are getting paid, but, and I think we do a good job on the paycheck side of it, but they are really here because they want to help communities in need. They want to help their neighbors, their friends. They want to be there when a disaster strikes. So it definitely brings mm -hmm. a, a different quality of person to our fleet. Interesting. You just mentioning pay. And one of the things that stands out, uh, one of the many places where you're different from a lot of other small fleets is on the, the benefits side. Uh, a lot of times smaller fleets have got sort of lighter benefits. Uh, they do what they can, but they don't really have that much. But you've got a very strong 401k program. You've got a lot of paid holidays. Uh, how do you manage to keep all of that you know, available for your drivers? 
Um, like I said, we run a very tight budget. We're not, um, because of what we do to sort of feed the children, we're not in business to make a big profit every year. That's not what we're here for. We're here to serve them. So, uh, <laughs> well, you know, anybody who wants to make a profit shouldn't be in the trucking industry. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, um, you yeah. know, we're here to serve, to serve, feed the children and, and their mission. And mm -hmm. so in doing that, um, you know, we're able to pour a lot back into our employees because, um, you know, we're able to provide those benefits and we are, you know, we are to be realistic in the recruiting world. We are competing with larger carriers that have a lot to offer. And so realistically, we have to be able to offer some of those things as well. Um, and so we, we really just follow suit if, you know, Feed the Children is offering 11 paid holidays a year, so are we. And if they're doing a 401k matching, so are we. And so because they're our parent company, we kind of follow suit with that and it translates for our drivers and it makes it a very attractive benefits package for them. So, you know, it, it's a good benefit to them. Um, we, we work really hard every year to maximize those benefits and make sure that they're getting the most of their benefits to encourage that they're investing in a retirement program and that they're using the insurance to its maximum. So um, we do a lot to make sure that they're using those benefits. Yeah, excellent. Uh, another thing that uh, you do differently than many other small fleets is on the, uh, the driver performance management and recognition side. And there's uh, a couple of things that have always stuck out for me. And uh, I have to ask you about the scorecard. I always loved your scorecard. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing for driver performance management and how you uh, make that uh, scorecard work. Um, so the scorecard, again, it works for us because we're a smaller company. If we had a lot more trucks, we would have to go to a more automated scorecard um, because it's already labor intensive with just 25 drivers. Um, but it we pour a lot of work into the scorecards. We do them once a quarter for the drivers and we pay a bonus to the drivers based off those scorecards. Um, but the scorecards aren't based on just fuel mileage or just safety aspects. They're based on so many things. Um, it's based on, you know, are they, um, you know, is there, or is their truck clean? Are they keeping their truck clean? Um, they're getting bonus points if they have a clean roadside inspection. Obviously there's negative points on the scorecard if they have one with violations. Um, but we're looking at just lots of different things. If we get compliments from a customer or even from a fellow employee, but they just say, man, this, this person just, they knocked it out of the park last week, or they went above and beyond here. We give them what we call kudos points um, on their scorecard. And we want to make sure to review that with them and say, hey, you know, so-and-so, they were bragging all over you and this is what they had to say about you. So we want to make sure that it's a, a positive interaction, even though sometimes there's, negative items on the scorecard and it's it's color coded it's a really pretty sheet um, it, it's essentially just a spreadsheet that has a lot to it but um as a lot of elements i don't remember the count on it but i think we're somewhere around you know 15 20 elements that we're looking at every quarter for the drivers um but it gives us the opportunity to also sit down face to face with them and say this is what you did so right this quarter and great job on this and here's some items that we need to work on. These are some things that we need some improvement on. Can you help us with this? Whether it's, it might be a low miles per gallon, or it might be that they idled the truck a lot or that they had a high speed. Um, but we're looking at those things and just asking for their help each quarter. And again, there's a bonus tied to it. So they want the bonus side of it. So the higher their score is, obviously the higher the bonus is each quarter. So there is that incentive with it as well. Okay. Uh, there's another one right there where you glossed over something where you're totally different from other people. Uh, it's not a conversation of here's what you need to do differently. It is a conversation of here's where we need some improvement. Can you help us with that? Uh, much more collaborative, simple, but very powerful phrasing that it is a collaborative effort to improve these items. So together we're working on fixing these things. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because there's, you know, they may, we may review something and they may tell us that this happened because of X, Y, or Z. And it, it is a partnership, you know, not everything that's on a scorecard is in the driver's control. Sometimes there are some things just like um, all of our staff, we have scorecards as well. There's things on my scorecard that I don't personally control, but I have oversight of. But if um, there are safety elements on there. I don't drive a truck, but if we have a truck in an accident, that reflects on me, just like some of the things on their scorecard. So it's really just that collaborative effort of what can we do better just as a whole, individually. Um, you know, we all have an off day. We all make mistakes. 
but how can we prevent it from happening? So we're we're really big on the prevention side rather than the retroactive of just trying to, okay, well, this happened. And so let's let's discipline you the for this, or um, you know, let's take this away because you did this. The idea is to prevent it from happening in the first place. And if we can use the example that somebody else has said, that's what we want to do. Nice. And you mentioned, I think you said 25 or so different items that are on there. I'm guessing you didn't start with all of those originally, that you started with something simpler. And just like you're talking about with the best fleets evaluation, you just go through the process of reviewing it and adding things over time. And now it's got to this point where it's quite mature, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, it started out years and years and years ago, um, just as a simple fuel bonus. It was just based on miles per gallon. How many miles did you run compared to how many gallons of fuel you use? And now it it has evolved into this. Um, we looked at, we took a bonus program for a little while that if you had an accident during the quarter, or if you had a negative inspection or a citation that wiped out your bonus for the quarter. And what we found was if in the first month of the quarter or the first week of the quarter, if they've already feel like they've lost their bonus for the quarter, then are they really going to be focusing on reducing idle time or not having a hard break occurrences? Um, are they going to be focused on that the rest of the quarter because they've already lost their bonus? They already know there's going to be a conversation coming that's going to be negative and they don't want that. So the idea was to um, incentivize, incentivize, sorry, for the entire quarter, not just one week of the quarter. We want to make sure that throughout the quarter, every single day that um, it's there that the the possibility of getting the bonus is there, but also the possibility of having a good score is there. And we take the scorecards too. We take it a, a kind of a little step further. Um, we have driver codes and they're not a social security number. Or, I mean, it, it's a confidential code, a very randomized four digit code. And we assign those to every driver. And that's for tracking purposes when we post reports in our office, which we do. So we have a scorecard, um, kind of a ranking every quarter that goes up. And we've got everybody in green, yellow, and red. And it's by their driver number. And so they can look at that and see where they stack up with all of their fellow drivers. And um, if they choose to share their number with somebody else or point out where they are on the list, that's up to them. But we don't do that. Um, and so we've seen it kind of get competitive a few times with some drivers in the hallway looking at the list and say, oh, well, I'm here. Where are you on the list? And um, but the scorecards have become a little bit of a competition, too. But we've also seen that, you know, if somebody's having a hard time with, let's say, hard breaks, they're talking to other drivers, not just us about that. They're saying, man, I had, you know, 10 hard breaks this last quarter. Um, how many did you have? What are you doing differently? What are you doing that I'm not doing? So they're really looking for advice from their peers to say, I want my score better. What was your score? What what did you do? And um, that's really the best possible scenario for us is that they're they're giving each other the the tips and the tricks and the information to do better because it makes us all better. And it's not just bonus. I think you also have a fair bit of recognition that you uh, give to these drivers each year. Like you do a driver of the year and you do some other types of uh, recognition programs for them too, right? We do. We do. So we do have an annual fleet safety awards. Um, it was a banquet before COVID. We had to kind of put a pin in that, but we are moving back into the banquet season, hopefully soon. Um, but we, um, we want to recognize them and their families that support them from home for what they do throughout the year. Um, so we do have driver of the year, um, safety professional of the year, driver mentor of the year, um, and it may be most miles driven safely, best fuel mileage, but we have a variety of different awards to recognize different areas and things that they touch. And there's runners up for the driver of the year and that part gets very competitive and they wanna know where did I score? Where did I rank? How far am I from getting driver of the year? But it's them pushing themselves to do better. They want that title. They want their name on the sign as driver of the year. They want the recognition that comes with it. Um, so they're pushing each other and, and kind of in a competition. Um, but they are uh, the the level of support we've seen among our drivers in the last several years has been just phenomenal. That they are supporting each other. It's not just a driver mentor during orientation. The follow up that they're doing with new drivers the way they're communicating with each other. They will spend time out on the yard with each other, showing different things on equipment they should be checking on a pre-trip, um, or they will give them advice. They will show them how to use an app or how to do something on their ELDs. Um, so the level of just help from peers has been phenomenal the last few years. Nice, nice. Uh, 
I think I'm coming to the end of the the questions that I had, uh, but I do want to talk about one more thing um, that that you guys do, and this, I think it's sort of in line with your, um, you know, sort of the the charitable. Uh, ideas that uh, are coming from your your parent organization, but you've been big supporters of truckers against trafficking, and uh, have you got all your drivers trained on that. So, um, you know, how did you get involved with that? And just talk a little bit about uh, you know you, what you do to get your drivers trained and how that experience has been. Um, it actually started with our local trucking association here in the state, Oklahoma Trucking Association, and through our safety committee there. Um, but they, of course, have speakers come to my, the meetings. Um, they have speakers at their different events throughout the year and conventions. And um, somewhere along the way, Truckers Against Trafficking came, the founders came and spoke about the program. Um, if you've ever had the opportunity to listen to them speak, um, they're very passionate. It is a very moving program. Um, but um, they shared their information, shared their program. Of course, there's lots of videos and tips and tools on their website. Um, but through doing that, we knew that that was something important, something we needed to share with our drivers. So in orientation, we share that with our drivers. Um, and there is just kind of like, it's essentially an orientation built type video where you can um, train your drivers on it. But we also have just the little cards with the information, the phone numbers, things that they can give out to somebody if they think that they need some place to call or go. Um, and then, of course, our drivers have the phone number so that they can call if they suspect something. So um, it, it's a tremendous program. So mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, fantastic service and nice to see people really embracing it. Uh, so uh, that uh, is most of the questions that I had. So um, anything, uh, any other thoughts, sort of uh, things that are on your mind or things that you're working on for next year to uh, surprise us with? I don't know that we have any surprises in the works. Um, we're looking into dash cams currently. Um, as far as technology goes, we're working on getting that in the budget. That's something we're looking at um, and have been visiting with lots of different vendors and things. Um, but that's something our drivers have been asking for. It's not, I mean, it's something that we would like, but our drivers are asking for it and wanting it as much as we are um, because they want to be protected if something goes wrong out on the road. Um, they want that extra layer of protection. So that's something that we're looking at. Um, you know, we're, I, I don't know of anything else specifically <laughs> right off the top of my head, but, um, you know, anything that we can do throughout the year to improve, we're going to do that. Um, we're looking forward to our driver committee meeting that's coming up. We have some things we want to cover with them. Um, you know, just to get some input and some information from them. So um, we're looking forward to that. And there's always some good information that comes from our drivers from those things. So, um, you know, hopefully things we can put into play soon. All right. Excellent. Well, thanks very much, Emery. Thanks for being part of this. And uh, as always, tons of great information. And it is immediately clear why you guys are in the Hall of Fame. And I look forward to uh, seeing what you come up with uh, for the next uh, edition of the program. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. We appreciate it.